uh, a quick reminder, uh, we're moving towards next ITC very soon, so be ready for that. Uh, next ITC papers are due April 4th, so I'm, re I'm sure you are preparing for that. And if you missed the, uh, the opening session, we are having next ITC, that's the 50th ITC, in Washington, November 10 to 15. Okay, we're looking forward to see all of you. By the way, because it's the 50th ITC, we have a special panel session to be held this afternoon uh, discussing the 58th ITC, and your contribution is needed there. So please make sure you attend that panel as well. Now I have the pleasure to invite Rob Aitken, who will moderate this session. Rob? All right, so in addition to the ITC 50 panel, the second half of this session is also a panel at the same time. So that will be a much, much, much better session than the ITC 50 panel, so please be sure that you attend that. <laughs> we have a, an interesting format this year for our last keynote plenary session. We have five speakers and they're all going to give perspectives on AI and it, it, because there's such a diversity of speakers and topics, I think it'll be a really informative session if you have questions for any of the speakers, bring those to the panel, because that's where we're going to uh, have a more in-depth discussion. Because we have five speakers and a limited amount of time, there's always the challenge of how will we enforce time limits, so this is where you guys get to help, because what we'll do is we'll have this little timer here, and then it goes off and it makes a noise, in theory, let's see. There we go. So when you hear that, that means that it's time to start looking askance at all the presenters and saying, and then they'll wrap up. That's mine. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, our first speaker in this session will be Ann Gattaker. She's a principal research staff member with IBM. She's been at IBM for, uh, for quite some time after completing her PhD at CMU, and she's been doing a lot of research in AI-related topics. She will introduce us to the general broad concepts of AI, so please welcome Ann. Okay, so Rob didn't steal the clicker, that's good. Um, yeah, so I promised that I would give a deep learning perspective um, here today. Um, so first I'm gonna mention how I'm using the term deep learning, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how deep learning has been applied in some other fields. And then taking inspiration from those other fields, um, sort of ponder how deep learning could be applied in the test field. So I'm using the term deep learning to, to refer to neural networks that have multiple layers, sort of simple as that. Um, so a, a great example of an area where deep learning is being used to, to enormous effect at the moment is computer vision. So here's sort of the canonical example for com, uh, computer vision using deep learning. Um, you have a neural network and you wanna take an image, so pixels, and provide a, a class label. Um, so on the left side here, we have our pixels. We have an, a neural network, which presumably has multiple layers. And on the right, we have class layers, uh, class labels with confidences. So like um, this particular image uh, was labeled as a tree frog with a small percentage, as a face with a very high percentage confidence, or a car with a low percentage confidence. So for me, this, I've been kind of working in the computer vision field um, a, a little bit for the better part of a year, and it is just remarkable to me that you literally take pixel values, like X, Y's and intensity for RGB for an image. You stick it in, and on the, uh, on the other end comes this very abstract concept, which is a thing, like a tree frog or, or a face. Um, so this is sort of what's been going on in the field and how does it get there? Um, sort of in a nutshell, these networks learn from trading data increasingly abstract features. So um, here we have a, an output of a network, and I guess I'll point at this one, um, that has, see it? Okay, so it's trying to do face recognition. So here at the bottom we have the inputs, which are, which are the pixels. Um, so starting with the pixels, the first layer of the network learns fairly simple features, things like edges of various locations, maybe a dot, maybe a curve. And then the next layer 
learns more abstract, more complex, and more useful features. So for example, it might learn that like a curve with a blob underneath is something that is dis helpful and discriminative for this task. And you know, we as people can see, oh, that's an eye in layer two. Um, but then the network doesn't have a label for it, but it figures out that this more complex, um, that more complex concept is useful. And then at the top layer, for us, it's very easy to see that those are human faces. Um, so this is sort of how, how these networks work. Um, a huge factor in the explosion of success, recent success in computer vision is owing to a single factor, a data set called ImageNet. Um, this was a data set that was originally published in 2009. It's, uh, was the start of a contest where people uh, submit entries doing visual recognition using the data set. In 2012, there was a leap, um, a, a network was published um, that was 40%, 41% better than the nearest competitor, which was really um, important for deep learning. So it showed that deep learning is a viable strategy for machine learning. And arguably, this was triggered the explosion of deep learning in, in machine learning research. Um, and it also very importantly showed that in this era, data is at least as important as algorithms. And it allowed a particular breakthrough that is referred to as transfer learning, where basically we um, take a network, train it on ImageNet, it has 14 million high quality images, and then reuse this for, for various purposes. So ImageNet trained networks is, is a phrase that you hear all the time in, in computer vision. So these are networks that were sort of designed to do object classification, designed and trained with ImageNet, and then used for all kinds of stuff. Things like object detection, which is harder than object classification. Um, semantic se segmentation, which is like you take a street scene and you say, oh, okay, here's, here's the street, here's the yard, here's a traffic cone. Scene recognition, like is it the beach or is it an office? And then some, one of the um, most important things in recent conferences has been human pose estimation. So like taking a picture of someone who's going like this and figuring out where their bones are, where, the, where their body parts are. And then video recognition, is somebody jumping or are they waving? Um, so all of these things, the, the state of the art networks, almost always, I, in fact, I think it's close to say always, embed ImageNet trained networks. That's how important the, the data set and the networks they spurred are. So the data set features are size and quality. Um, so computer vision has really had a lot of revolution. Natural language processing also has, has uh, benefited from, from the deep learning. So sort of a baseline way of representing a document, which sometimes is just a sentence for natural language, is bag of words, that's what it's called. And it's just sort of, is this word there or is it not where, there? It's a very sparse representation. Um, word embeddings came along. These are pre-trained embeddings that are available, um, pre-trained on like a Twitter corpus or a Wikipedia corpus that made a a great deal of progress for the field in helping to understand, like not just look at a word one at a time, but look at its neighbors to kind of help understand. But even that is a relatively shallow um, way of looking at things. And I, I put a reference at the bottom of, of a blog post that sort of inspired me. They, they liken word embeddings, this shallowness of the features, as like an edge detector in computer vision, like we saw the first layer not very complex. And so the, the latest work is going deeper, coming up with more uh, abstract and complex features to do a better job in the, in the natural language processing space. Okay, so can we do this? Um, so an example problem in the test field is to determine which patterns are useful ones. And I don't know, other people probably remember this quote from, from Phil Nice saying that his wife who was in advertising said that 99% of advertising is just wasted. But how do you find that 1%? And it's the same thing with chip test. Many, many patterns that we apply to chips, they, they don't do anything, they don't detect anything. But how do you find that 1%? So let's imagine that we wanted to solve this problem with deep learning. So basically the, the picture of the problem could be, you know, you have the neural network and your inputs are a design description and historical test patterns that have been applied. Your output for training data is a historical use for usefulness determination. Did this pattern detect something or did it not? And the idea would be to train a model 
to determine when you have a new test pattern, will it be useful? So those other fields used training data and neural networks basically to learn useful and increasingly abstract concepts. So in test, could we do that? You know, do we have something like that? And I, I think we do. If we think about some of the concepts that we've learned hard won over the years, things like redundancy for faults, controllability and observability, critical area, those are, those are concepts, abstract concepts, that we use to help us answer this question. Um, so the, these are sort of the, the concepts and features that are useful for the task at hand. So what we need to learn these is sort of a sufficiently large data set that's representative of the problem space in, in our discipline. So th this is sort of the vision. This is, this is my last slide, Rob. So, um, <laughs> So essentially, I think this is really exciting. Given the right training, we could implicitly learn higher level concepts, things like critical area or observability that, that we learned a, a much harder way. Of course, it would be, again, implicit. Or there may be other features that we, we just haven't thought of. Um, so I was hanging out with an IBM fellow at a computer vision conference, and one of the things he said r r really hit me hard because it's, it's been hard to sort of take a deep learning mindset. Um, some of us tried doing feature engineering for a while, but then we realized that the networks are just better than we are at finding these features, like those computer vision networks. They find the features, and they work great. And when we try to engineer our own features, we don't do as well. So well-trained, deep networks can be that smart, but we need large, high-quality data sets to uh, be able to, to uh, support that. So, so the idea here is we can implicitly learn, implicitly, cool and relevant concepts without us even having to think of them. Um, and then we can all retire and live off our stock options. Thanks very much, Anne, and uh, we'll see how the retiring and living off the stock options thing goes. So, uh, Hopefully. Our next speaker is Shin Li Gu, and he is a uh, senior director at Huawei USA in charge of product reliability. He has a PhD from Linköping University in Sweden, and he is going to bring us the system perspective. Part of the system perspective is connecting an HDMI cable and hoping that somehow or other nothing is broken since we tested it a few minutes ago and it all worked. So. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Uh, so my talk will be uh, focused on in a system house. So we produce uh, network switching routers and how we use AI and to see the business values. So my talk will cover two things. One is, uh, you know, we use the AI as actually a process today. So we start pretty earlier, uh, I would say seven, eight years ago. And we see the values today is a formally to archive all the data we need it from different perspectives. So from the design, our supplier, our manufacturing, even down to the field, our customer uh, returns. So we're recording all of those data and try to link them together. And then secondly, not only the data, but we use the data to discover extra value, which we, we thought in the past was uh, typically was pretty hard. So I will go through my talk and I'll give you some example how we use those data to produce the value. So when I say the value, it's really in our products, in our process of designs, and today we see the huge values. So the most challenge, if you look at our products, so geometrically uh, our products you know, distribute to uh, any products. So, so we have maybe tens of thousands of products, any of those products. They typically go, you know, cover uh, hundred something over um, countries. And those products, they are, the volume is higher, 
And this is products for customer size, but also look at manufacturing. So our manufacturing, we have our own lines in a different geographical locations, but also uh, we have uh, contract manufacturing to manufacture for us, uh, for those products. So how to tracking those manufacturing data, and especially also the supplier for those each uh, contract manufacturing, they could be different. So anything happen, can we find out anything quickly? What is the root cause of the products, right? So this is one of the challenge. And secondly, when you look at the real engineering, um, the uh, returns, so any products failures in the field, typically just indicating the function doesn't work. And so when we get the products, we first look at the, the system, which means software and then the boards. So try to debug and diagnosis. And of, of course, uh, many of times we have to go back to further to the component level to see what's actually happened, what's getting wrong there. So, and the most often, you know, it's maybe 80% of the cases we say no trouble found. We couldn't find anything for the, for the hardware part. It's very hard to uh, indicate what's actually affecting the functionality of the products but it, uh, it's a structural uh, defects in, in the components as hardware. So with that challenge, what our perspective, uh, our, our view vision is try to get all the data. So from every you know, stage, the whole life cycle of the products, from design, supplier, chip manufacturing, boats manufacturing, and then a field operation and maintenance data. So we, we archive all those data. Try to make you know, the link and analyze as a whole. So the analysis, uh, the two uh, few example, if you just look at the, those uh, the red page. So in the design stage, one of the very challenge is when you have a product designed, how do you verify the design is correct? In other words, you are not able to simulate, or even you have a product ready, you are not able to test all the combination of a products. So that's a challenge. So do we aware that any product has um, any hidden uh, bugs inside? Or maybe there's any, you know, the performance uh, impact, or there's uh, any maybe the, the the spec does not actually on, on uh, for those corners. When I say corner, doesn't ha have to be the hardware corner, but it could be the software configuration with specific other products configuration with applications uh, causing the spec does not perform as we as we committed. So that's one of the verification stage. In the manufacturing, obviously, you know that if there's any products, we see the problems. If we don't know it, we still keep shipping and we still keep in the manufacture. The result is you still manufacture lots of products which has hidden problems there. And also, even worse, for those products, you can hold on, but you ship to customers already. So that return costs more money. And certainly, uh, you're talking about you know, how the manufacturing cost the test, right? We're talking about the test. It's a long period of time of testing, but also uh, in oven burning test, which is even more expensive. So in that case, is lots of heat, lots of electricity will be consumed. So we consume lots of electricity from any of those cities. We have manufacturing lines. So the city has a requirements, how much power we can, we can, we, we can use for the, for the burning test. So, and then in the field, back to the field, uh, so even though we have lots of design knowledge, with lots of uh, you know, reliability designs, and in, in manufacturing, we try to test whatever we can, but we still get, cannot guarantee everything we find. So what we do is, in the products, you know, like airplanes, we try to monitor everything which in the past, we use FMEA to archive all the historical uh, any, any issues possibly can happen. So we monitor those areas with the products. Of course, that time, we're not talking about the structural monitoring, but mostly it's a functional monitor. So monitor those cases and try to avoid, actually, before the impact the custom applications. And of course, when things do does happen, then we try to reheal by the product itself. So from that perspective, you see, it's really the life cycle. We did lots of, uh, you know, the, 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 for, uh, lots of stuff for the reliabilities. And then lots of technologies is uh, uh, machine learning's AI related uh, approach. So uh, this I will give some example here. So one of the example here is uh, how to use the machine learning to discover all the corner cases in a product. And obviously the products, you know, when you say you try to simulate or you want to test the products, it's impossible to extreme test all exhaustive uh, functionalities. So obviously you need to discover where is somewhere in the areas combinations of the configuration, custom application, most likely affecting one of the you know, application of my product's uh, spec, right? So you need to discover for the whole multiple dimensions, where is the areas you want to? So that is a pretty challenging uh, job. So in our cases, you know, in the lab, we try to be more effective. So this example will show you. So how, first of all, with all the combination, we call factors. For those factors, what other factors contributes most to the specs I'm interested in? And also not only some of those factors, but also combination of the factors. So by the AI searchings, 
we can be very effective quickly to reaching those interesting areas, even though we don't simulate exhaustively, but however, we cover majority of those areas, which is a critical impact to my uh, spec of the products. And we can discover, for example, some of those are the design bugs inside of my ASIC or inside of my software we can, uh, you know, to repair or maybe to, um, to, uh, to uh, change the designs. Or some of those, it's hard to, uh, fi uh, to fix it. But then in the, in the field, we may try to avoid the configuration and we can use some other alternative modes to still perform the function but not going to the domains that, that our product spec will be affected. So that's one of the areas in the design uh, phase, how we use AI to reach faster and find the more interesting, interesting areas which are affecting the, area, uh, the, the, the functionalities. And the second example is in the manufacturing. Manufacturing, so our boards has two uh, issues. One is a large boards, which maybe have like 20,000 components and we have 100,000 sort of joints. For those components, the components, are, some of these are very tiny. So they are maybe, you know, it's like millimeters that tiny. And some of the big ones, there are thousands of pins connected. For such a large uh, boards, how do we diagnose this quickly if there's a test failure? Or how can we you know, analyze if there's sort of joints and issues? So that's a pretty hard job. In the past, we do have some, uh, you know, uh, the AI machine uh, to look at it quickly, but those are not effective. So now we have deep learning capability. We have GPUs. We do full thorough uh, the, the, the inspections. So by combining all the test results, which are digitalized, and with the, you know, the, 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 the vision of the vision and the, the image processing of the boards and combined with uh, lots of analog signals, we combine it together. We do a sub analyze and we can be within one minute or we should say few seconds. We can allocate where the problem is. So the end result is, first of all, we save human resources. Secondly, it typically takes like a day something to figure out, but now it's in, let's say, one minute at a time you can figure out um, the, the cases. And certainly, uh, accuracy wise, it's more interesting. In the past, such a complications, you may end up with like, you know, uh, maybe 50 or 40 percent of the accuracy to say where the components or where the, the issues. But now we are moving up to uh, maybe several ten, tens of uh, the percentage up, uh, the percentage is more accurate de uh, designs. The second challenge is like form business, right? Form business, we're talking about uh, if it's not billions, but something like close to several hundred millions of phones. And it, just consider how many phones have to go through repair. So those repairs, it's a very, you know, people, human uh, resource con con consumptions. So if we can use the AI approach to do automation, to accurate repairs, which can save tons, tons of money for us. Uh, so that's what be the benefits for both company and for the customer as well. And this, another example is when we also, I, I mentioned earlier, we do lots of burning tests. So those tests typically uh, takes a long time. So how to minimize the test? So we, we need to consider, uh, you know, how to, um, for some of those uh, products, we, may, we may don't have to run through the whole test. So it depends on the feature early, uh, early design of the product's test. So we can decide selectively to do different tests for different products. So this is uh, the question, how we analyze early data and decide later on stage uh, the burning test or packaging level testing or process level testings. So we treat each product differently based on the earlier test. And the last example I have, so when you have the, all of those stage tests and each stage may went through different tests. So some of these, you know, they never find anything. They can be op optimized. And some of these, they discover similar things. So if we, they are just equal equivalent A and B tests, it's easy to remove one of them. But sometimes it's much more complications. So we use, utilize, uh, we use AI approach. So in the first example, in the, in the left corners, upper left corners, so for each board, the blue corners, that's all the tests that went through the pass or fails, and then each horizontal is one of the tests. So we look at a combination of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of those tests, and what are the implications of the tests, which can be combinationally to move some of these. So by optimizing them, we can you know, save the test time a lot. So this approach actually, you know, we can uh, save from 20% up to like 50, even 60% of the test, but then it is equivalent from the history, whatever the volume we produce, the failures we had, we can still use that um, minimized, optimized test to effectively run the test for the business. So that saves tons of money as well. So I will finish my talk here with the last slides, uh, which I pretty much mentioned. First of all, it's a knowledge accumulation in the products and then with the data analysis, we find the values in the, pro uh, in the, in the whole life cycle of the products. And then the real value is, to fast, uh, you know, allocate with issues, accuracy, and the knowledge, knowledge accumulation will transfer the knowledge from one business to the other. There are similarities sometimes, and of course, the, the resource savings.
All right, before we get to our next speaker, just a reminder that on the back of your name tag is the secret code to download the proceedings. So if you have not already done that, it would be good for you to do that. Our next speaker is Ken Butler, who's a fellow emeritus at Texas Instruments and graduated from UT Austin, and then his supervisor went off to Texas A&M, so you make your own joke there. He's going to give us the semiconductor test perspective and well, let's welcome Ken. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to, you know, uh, Jin Lee talked about the overall perspective, among which some of the things was talked about the chip testing. I'm going to kind of zoom in on that or whatever and talk about the semi manufacturing and test. And, you know, the really cool thing about working in a semiconductor facility or whatever is they are a giant data generator of all forms of data. You know, so, you know, uh, besides the manufacturing data, we have a, a tons of sources of IC test data that we can go and analyze. And that's especially true in a place like uh, uh, TI where, uh, you know, a large fraction of the uh, portfolio is analog in nature. And so we take, you know, a significant fraction of the test content is analog with a lot of parametric measurements that we can go off and use uh, to great value in order to be able to, uh, you know, tune the product. So I went off and did a Google search and I saw... Uh, uh, in, coincidentally enough, some information from uh, uh, Corvo, which is right up the road for us or wherever, and this is going back to the uh, manufacturing space where they're looking at using machine learning in order to be able to pull information off the semi-equipment and do tuning in order to improve their recipes, tighten up their limits, and, you know, get better yield out of their system. And we're doing something similar. This is a, some, a shot from a paper that was presented internally at TI. Uh, some weeks ago or whatever where they're, you know, sim similarly looking at things like uh, ga uh, chamber pressure and temperature and looking for when things start to drift out of control. Uh, and, you know, in, the, in an, an application like this, the signal to noise ratio can be kind of challenging because this kind of data tends to be somewhat noisy in nature, but you can still extract meaningful information and then be able to react to it. Um, is this a new thing? Well, uh, not really. Uh, you know, Yorgos Makris came and gave a talk at TI uh, a few weeks ago at a, at a workshop, and you know, he made the point that if you look back in the literature here from this conference, there's stuff that's been published going back all the way to the mid-80s uh, kinds of things. And uh, you know, so people have been thinking about this problem for a while, and there's a tremendous amount of useful information you can pull out of that. And then, you know, just this here at the conference this week, uh, we saw our general chair presents uh, AIA, if I pronounced that correctly or whatever, which if you saw that session was pretty impressive where they were doing a natural language processing and be able to do pretty remarkable things in terms of uh, wading through the data and, and making useful information. If you ever see Lee give a talk, he's always good at sneaking in pictures of other people, so I figured turnabout was fair play. I had to do that. Um, and there's a paper reference at the bottom here by Hada Lampos that was presented at ETS this year. A hundred references are there about or whatever. It's a tremendous thing to go off. I'd say you suggest you go off and take a look at that to kind of see what all has been done here and in other conferences around the world. Uh, uh, AI, it, it, and when we're going to take advantage of this information, you know, we ought to, I, myself, and I think others probably leap to, well, it's probably, you know, something that you're going to use to monitor the silicon and be able to do something about the silicon. But it's not always the case. And uh, as, you know, so... In the late 90s, early 2000s, there was, you know, a series of papers uh, starting with uh, Rob Dash and Bob Madge and then a bunch of other people, uh, you know, publishing work where they were going off and using, you know, advanced outlier techniques and, and adaptive test methodologies uh, to great benefit. And we've done that as well, and we've now deployed, you know, our, our approach to this on thousands of programs in production. And... Uh, we have monitoring capability. There was um, a mention of that in, uh, in Jin Lee's talk or whatever. And, and we do the same thing. And, you know, if you go and follow up on these things, so you'll, you'll monitor what's going on with the outliers in production, and then you'll get notified when something looks like it's getting out of control. And if you go up and follow on these things, it's often, as often as not, not the silicon that's the issue. Uh, you know, uh, Dave, my colleague Dave uh, Shaw published a paper here at ITC two years ago about this, and there were things like the, uh, you know, a tester fan going bad and probe cards with wear out issues and stuff like that, you know, they have absolutely nothing to do with silicon. So there's a lot of value that you get beyond just being able to make sure that the silicon is doing what it's supposed to. So I think the next phase of that work, you see a lot of work these days coming out on clustering methods, applications for that are in adaptive test flows, quality, yield recovery, uh, yield recovery, and a lot of other things. Um, 
And we're trying to integrate, integrate new data sources, and I just sat through Dave Armstrong's talk, and uh, he kind of, you know, uh, brought up a similar kind of point that there's a lot of other information that you can take advantage of that, at least in our case, we're not uh, really doing a good job of yet. So I mentioned the equipment example on my first slide, you know, and, and, and of course we're using the test data, but design is a tremendous source of information. If you can merge that in, in independent data source in along with all the other data sources you're looking at, you can make even more intelligent decisions. We collect loads of simulation data, validation data for all of our parts, and it's kind of sitting there in a warehouse, and we could make it, take advantage of that as yet another form of information that we could use to, uh, use to drive decision making for the part. So the challenges ahead are using the right models and right data sources for the job. What we find when we apply these in, uh, you know, in a large scale or whatever is that depending the, on the specific type of issue that you're trying to track down in manufacturing, you may have a, oh, I thought I heard the, uh, the, the alarm go off. Of, Thought I haven't hit my 10 minutes yet. Um, you can, you have, there's different kinds of models that you would, you would want to choose. Uh, you could be spatial, temporal in nature, uh, you know, there's other things that you would want to do and, and knowing which one to apply in which scenario can be a difficult thing. So having some level of automation around being able to uh, automatically choose those and maybe they could be time varying where sometimes you're using a spatial model, other times you're using a temporal model in order to track down whatever particular issue you're trying to, you're trying to deal with in production. Data accuracy, data cleanliness, timeliness, the storage and archival and retrieval, these are issues that we run into all the time and, and Anne kind of remarked about that. They're perennial issues. Outsourcing is one that we've talked about a lot at this conference where you, know, you, have a, you don't have a captive manufacturing flow and you're bringing in outside uh, contractors and how do you deal with the data movement? You know, Dave Armstrong talked about that in his talk this morning. So they're all challenges but we can meet them and I think we should just go forward as we're doing in this conference and continue to address the issues together. Thank you. All right, so Ken did a, a great job with time management there, so well done. So at this point, you should be thinking about your questions that you're going to bring to the panel, which you remember are attending instead of some other panel that Yvonne mentioned. But our next speaker is Ira Leventhal from Adventist, and uh, he's Vice President of New Concept Product Initiative at Adventist America. He's got 25 plus years of experience in the industry. He's got a degree from MIT and he's currently focused on how AI can be applied to semiconductor tests. So let's welcome Ira. Thank you, Rob, and thanks for uh, keeping us on time. I went about three seconds over when I did my dry run last night, so Anne graciously gave me three seconds of her time, so thank you, Anne. All right, I think I just used up those three seconds, so time to get going. So I'm gonna talk about some real-world successes that we've been able to achieve at using AI techniques in semiconductor data analytics. So before I get into that, I wanted to talk about how we separate some of the hype from the reality in terms of artificial intelligence. And so I've got a few quotes up here to give some idea of what people are saying, what's going to happen with AI. You've got Stephen Hawking saying that AI is basically going to take over, start redesigning itself, and humans are going to be superseded. Claude Shannon, who's the father of information theory, saying that we will become the robots, what dogs are currently to humans, and oh, by the way, he's rooting for the machines. And then you've got this last quote, before we work, we work on artificial intelligence, why don't we do something about natural stupidity? So, this does not paint a very hopeful picture <laughs> for the human race or the, 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 uh, the test community. So, and it's this kind of thinking that has led to this idea that, that AI, machine learning, neural networks, it's some sort of magic bullet that you can just apply to solve any problem. Well, so can it solve any problem? Well, the answer is sort of. Uh, Ian Goodfellow, who wrote the uh, Deep Learning book, uh, here's what he had to say. He says, a feed-forward network with a single layer is sufficient to represent any function, but the layer may be infeasibly large and may fail to learn and generalize correctly. Okay, so great. So it can solve any problem, but by the way, I may not be able to actually build the network to solve that problem, and even if I can build it, it may not work. All right, so, so where do we go with that? Well, there's just a few minor issues we need to solve. And here's the minor issues. We don't have infinite storage, infinite computing power, or infinite data. 
So small issues, but I, I'm going to propose a way that, that I think we need to follow to solve the issues. And that is, we need to put together the following. We have all of these these great algorithms, these great machine learning and neural network algorithms that have been developed, they represent this toolbox that we can apply to solving different problems. But we can't just like throw that toolbox out at the problems and walk away. We need to combine that with a solid understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of each tool. We need to also apply an intelligent application of the tools to the problem spaces that they're most applicable, and then intelligently interpret the results. And the intelligence that I'm talking about in those uh, last several cases is not the artificial intelligence, but it is the human intelligence. So I think we really shouldn't look at it as the, the machines, the robots, the AI versus humans. It's how can we put together our intelligence and the artificial intelligence in the best way. OK, so I mentioned understanding strengths and weaknesses as being key. So let's take a look at the key weaknesses, some of the key weaknesses of machine learning algorithms, and you know, specifically like neural networks in this case. They don't know the rules, they require lots of data, and they don't have feelings. So one rule that they don't inherently know is don't touch that hot stove. They also don't have the feelings that when they touch that hot stove one time, they know that's a bad thing to do. Maybe after we give it, I don't know, a, a few thousand instances of touching the hot stove and, and getting burned, they say, all right, I'm not going to do that anymore. But by, by that point, your hand is scorched pretty badly. So that's probably not a good thing to have a, a, uh, a machine learning algorithm deciding for you. Okay, let's look at the key strengths of machine learning algorithms. They don't know the rules, they require lots of data, and they don't have feelings. Okay, now wait a minute. W weren't those the key weaknesses? Well, it depends. If you're looking at uh, finding a needle in the haystack like you see in that picture, then these types of things actually become strengths. If you're like when you're trying to find, for example, some, some very hard to spot relationships in, in data, it's really important not to get caught up in feelings and rules and all that. Uh, a group from uh, Stanford did, a, uh, they did some research in the last couple of years where they developed a deep learning network to look at pictures of skin lesions. And from the picture, they were able to diagnose whether the lesion was a malignant melanoma tumor or just a benign tumor. What they found was that their network outperformed board-certified dermatologists in being able to make those diagnoses. And the reason they determined was that the board-certified board dermatologists were using a set of rules. They have these A, B, C, D, E rules of what constitutes a malignant melanoma. And if it didn't fall into those rules, they would throw that one out and say, well, that's not malignant. But they were missing diagnoses because they were so fixed on those rules, whereas the, the machine learning, the neural networks, didn't care. So the question of whether these are strengths or weaknesses, it really depends on the problem that you're uh, trying to solve. So I'd like to talk about how we've been able to apply these algorithms at Avantest to look at how to solve some of these needle in a haystack types of problems. And one specific area that we've looked at is calibration and coming up with a smarter approach. Now with calibration, you typically have challenges of many different input parameters. You don't know how those inputs affect all the outputs. You're under the gun, you've got to create that calibration routine quickly, so you go with your gut feel. Gut feel sometimes works, but sometimes the gut feel can come out being pretty painful. So we've come up with a proposed approach. The idea is we start with a constrained random test generation approach where we are covering a multi-dimensional input parameter space by smartly selecting a subset of the combinations of how the inputs can affect the outputs. And we then, based on the initial data that we get from that, we generate even more test cases in the areas where dependencies are found. We then take that data and we put that together with applying proprietary machine learning algorithms to identify the input parameters that are truly ha having influence on the output values. And even in some cases, very small influences it's able to uh, determine. So let's take a closer look at what that looks like. The idea is what we call intelligent data-driven characterization. We divide it into three steps. The first step is to generate these constrained random tests. Uh, and I mentioned we do that in a smart way to come up with a smart subset and then do additional generation of tests in the areas of interest. And we run these tests on, on multiple uh, devices to gather the data. Now, an important factor here is this is all done up front. The data is gathered up front, and then 
taken off the system for analysis. And contrast that to maybe in the past you would have used a uh, process of doing iterative schmooing of different parameters uh, to find out where the relationships were. And not only are you going to use up a lot of tester time when you're doing that, but you're going to tend to go with what you know, and you're not going to find those hidden influences that you wouldn't expect. So once we have all that data off the tester, then we're able to analyze that in great detail and truly navigate that high dimensional space and find out those influencing factors, some of which are you know, pretty small and would be hidden. So here's what this looks like when we applied that to a real case. This is, this is real data from uh, one of the uh, uh, devices in our tester hardware that required calibration. So what we did was we generated over 500,000 test cases where we varied all the parameters and we did that in the smart way that I described to collect the data, especially in the areas where dependencies were found. So we understood those in great detail. Once we had basically that model of the system and how the inputs uh, impacted the outputs, we now had a model that we could use over and over again to run what we called virtual calibrations. And this is where we proposed calibrations as you know, looking at different input parameters and how they would affect the output parameters. And this was all done in an automated fashion by the system and all done offline once we had that model. And for each of those cases, we predicted the calibration error. And so you see the data here on the slide. The, on this, uh, this, top, this top slide, the top graph over here, it shows the effect of the, the, uh, the VEXP and driver state uh, inputs on the output uh, variable of interest. And those were the, the inputs that we expected to have effect on the calibration. Uh, so that was no surprise that those came up as having impact. And the error that we were able to achieve when we considered those two inputs was about uh, 0.6 millivolts of RMS error. But the system was able to go even further. What the bottom graphs show is that after calibrating out for those first two input variables, now it shows the residual error. And the system was able to identify a further influence of the V-swing input, which was unexpected even by the, the designer of the device. And so the system was truly able to find this arbitrary and kind of unknown beforehand dependency because it wasn't following the rules and it was just going by the data and churning through that in a, in a smart way. And the result was we were able to reduce the RMS error down to uh, under 200 microvolts when we added in that, uh, that third calibration. So this was an automated way and a better way of defining the calibration that could truly find these arbitrary dependencies and make these small effects visible. So now I want to circle back to my original question of can machine learning solve everything? And I showed those quotes at the beginning which painted this doom and gloom picture. So I want to give something, leave you with something that's a little more hopeful for the audience. And so I'm going to throw in my own quote to the, this uh, litany of machine learning quotes that are out there. And so my answer to the question is, well, machine learning can't solve everything on its own. But if you take the right learning, machine learning methodologies, you apply those to the right applications and combine them with human intelligence, they can solve a wide range of problems and solve them better, faster, and sooner than we previously thought possible. Thank you. All right, so that was 10 minutes and eight seconds. So apparently Ira's calibration methodology is pretty good, you know. <laughs> he got the extra three and then I gave him three more, just why not? Okay, so our final speaker in this section is Cheng Wen Wu and he is a distinguished chair professor at the National Xinhua University in Taiwan. And he is going to talk to us about kind of the countrywide strategy that Taiwan is employing in AI. So, Cheng Wen. So this session is about AI in test. And um, I was assigned by Lee to talk about uh, perspective from Taiwan semiconductor industry, which is quite, a, uh, quite strange to you, right? So you, you think you know Taiwan? Probably not. I'm going to talk about the perspective from the entire country. 
However, I'm, I'm going to answer the question first that Rob is going to ask in, in the afternoon for the panel session. Will AI eliminate the need for test engineering? And my answer is no. Because AI cannot guarantee zero defect in semiconductor product. Never. Human beings make mistakes. AI also makes mistakes. Let, there's no guarantee, no 100% accuracy in AI. No, not any problem. AI cannot guarantee 100% coverage of defects or other issues. I believe everybody in, in this room knows about AI. And some of you might have tried to use AI to solve problems in the past few years, right? I have done that also. Um, no 100% accuracy. Even, even the most mature problem of image classification, no 100% accuracy. I haven't seen any application that AI can solve with 100% accuracy, no. So if you're asking for zero defect, zero DPPM, zero DPPB for automotive, it cannot solve it by AI. There's no way. So my answer is no. However, AI can be a tool in, in your toolbox okay, to improve performance, like several um, our keynote speakers have talked about. In many applications, AI can help human beings to improve the performance. So in classification, opinion, diagnosis, prediction, optimization, and so on, and even in the future, real-time online repair, defect, fault, error tolerance, and so on. So because of that, R&D reinvestment by governments all over the world have give, give us some hope. Now this arm, arms race in AI, as you can see, in China, in, in the US, but you, you might not have known that even in Taiwan, our government has spent or decided to, to, stand, to spend so much money, so much funding in AI research. And according to the House of Representatives of the US, um, maybe in uh, next year, the R&D spending of the Chinese government will surpass the US, as shown in, in, in this graph. What about in Taiwan? Our government has decided to invest in AI also. There are so, so many programs shown in, the, in this slide by the Ministry of Science and Technology, which fund, which fund mainly the universities, and by the Ministry of Economic Affairs, which mainly fund the research in, in the industry, domestic and international, and also by the Ministry of Education, try to educate more people, experts in AI. Not just the research experts, but also practitioners, application engineers, and thousands of people require to, to be trained to enter this field. So I'm gonna talk about Taiwan more. Population is about 23 million, more than 23 million. And from this map, semiconductor industries in Taiwan are mainly located in Xinjiang, in Taichung, and in Tainan. There are so many fabs in, in, in Taiwan, a small island. However, the GDP of Taiwan, about 550 billion US dollars, among them, about 16% contributed by semiconductor, a very high percentage. And the reason are shown here, 68.5% of high school graduates go to college in Taiwan. So up more than 45% of the population aged between 25 and 64 hold a bachelor's degree or higher. That shows that in Taiwan, 
we have highly skilled workforce and a high percentage are in semiconductor industry. The annual gra graduates in science and technology, the number, there are, there are 94,000 bachelor's degree graduates and about 28,000 with master's degree. And in the past 40 years, double E tops the ranking and salary in Taiwan. This, this, this is very, very, very specific among all countries in the US, I, I mean in the world. And the IC ex export is expected to exceed 90 billion this year. This is more than 30% among all exports in Taiwan. In the past maybe 40 years, I, I, I show this uh, result, I calculated the numbers. And in the table, 87, 97, 207, and, and 2017, without, without including the uh, foundries, there's no Taiwanese company in the list. There's only one company, MediaTek, appeared in 2016, only one year. But in, in the list last year, there's no Taiwanese company. However, I think you, you know that in Taiwan, there's a unique ODM foundry, offset, and fabulous ecosystem in Taiwan. And the, the industry, semiconductor industry, provides more than 230,000 jobs, relatively high paid jobs in Taiwan, taking care of so many families. And Taiwan is a global leader in foundry, with market share about two thirds. And for the offset industry, the market share is about 50%. This is, this is the uh, revenue of the company, TSMC, which is, which is representative of the semiconductor industry in the past 30, 40 years. To win the AI gold rush, we know that AI chips are very important. Just, not just the algorithms, the data. The chips, the hardware is very important. Key, key players. However, among all these very famous companies in the world working on AI chips, we have to know that behind the scenes, for the global AI business, there's Taiwan inside. Why? The ODMs of Taiwan provides AI device and data center hardware. You might not know that all top 10 electronics ODMs, which provide the, the, the white boxes to the data centers, to the uh, system companies, the top 10, all the top 10 are Taiwanese companies. All of them. And the foundries. The foundries may offer spec to RTL, the chip design. So system companies can go to TSMC asking for chips. They don't need to go to IC companies anymore. And also they are doing testing services. So there are two keywords here, testing and services. The offset, outsourced assembly and test. The companies are also working on machine learning enhanced services. The tools. I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you go back? And he also says, and then the test tools, equipment, vendors, 
also machine learning enhanced products. And the fibers, they are very good at RTL to GDS2 AI chip design. The companies in Taiwan are not, are not good at creating new markets, new products, new specs. However, they are good friends to brand name companies. They do DFT, IP, and test design services also. And the academia in Taiwan, this is a society called VSI Test Technology Forum, with more than 30 professors. The density is quite high. And they are working on tests and DFT. So in Taiwan, there's a multi-dimensional virtual integration covering everything. If you are going to do AI business, you will find a partner in Taiwan. The chameleon-like surviving skills in the past 40 years. So, I don't know why. Maybe we just show this slide. The final one. So, so far as AI is concerned, whoever you are, whatever you do, You've got a partner in Taiwan. You've got to believe it. Because we do everything, we do everything to serve you behind the scene. And without Taiwan, you're gonna you're gonna succeed in AI. Believe me. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your participation. That wraps up the keynote part of this. There will be a panel part, and despite my you know, enthusiastic encouragement of you to go to the panel, there are three other things you could potentially look at as well at the same time. But nonetheless, go to the panel. Don't forget your yellow cards and uh, find your lunch ticket, and your lunch is where it's been the last couple of days. So again, thanks everybody for attending, and thanks for our many keynote speakers as well.